Hats off to you in honor, but the message is about the hats that we wear as men. I want to appeal to that leadership hat that God has ordained for every man to wear. I want to encourage you and thank you for being the kind of man you are, the kind of leader that you are. You're a great leader because you're a great follower. The way you follow Jesus gives you leadership influence. Thank you for wearing that hat. Paul said in Ephesians that there are these hats. There's husband, father, worker, and warrior. Again, husband, father. And I would put right here, uh, I'm wearing a new hat, been wearing it for the last 10 months. It's one of my favorite yet, that of grandfather. Come on, that's an amazing. I, I preached in this last night. I was going to preach in it today. They said, but if you put it on the way it is here, it'll, it'll shadow everything, and I don't want to preach through the shadows. But I am honored to be a husband, to be a father, to be a grandfather, to be given the strength to work hard in the calling of God. And I'm honored to be in the spiritual battle as a warrior. I want to thank you for wearing these hats with passion and intentionality. I feel a gripping of the Holy Spirit today to focus on one of them. Thank God for the Holy Spirit because I was gonna preach one hour on each hat on Father's Day. <laughs> that would have taken until next Father's Day. Just one hat, the hat of being in the spiritual battle as a warrior. A warrior, why? Because Jesus said to Peter, and it's the same for us, that Satan wants to sift us like wheat. The word sift means to break down. John said that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The theft of character to destroy testimony. Peter said that Satan, he goes about as a roaring lion. He's hunting great men of God to seek to devour them. That's the language, to break us down, destroy us, devour us. Would you agree with me today? We're in a battle. We're not walking through the park spiritually. We are in a battleground fighting a very real war, and it's against Satan. I'll declare who's on the winning side here in a moment, but I wanna make sure that we have the context, and that is, we're in a fight. Ephesians 6, verse 12, Paul says, for our struggle. That word struggle in the Greek is the word battle. It is not against flesh and blood. If we don't get this, then we'll fight the wrong battle, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world. It's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I believe, because the Bible says it, that that realm is as real as this realm. And that what is happening in that place has direct effect on this space and every space that we go into. The enemy plots, he is poised to try and be strategic in devouring, breaking us down, and destroying us. We are up against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil, and that seems rather daunting. So if you're going to fight someone stronger than you, you must find someone stronger than them. Today, our God, is the winner, let me just place this right here, incarnation, sinless life, crucifixion, resurrection. Jesus is 
the conquering king. Amen. And he has not placed us in this battle to fight in our own strength. Ephesians 5, even before he describes the hats we wear, that of husband, father, worker, warrior, before he gets to one of those, he says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Let the influence of your life come from spirit empowerment, the Holy Spirit empowering you. Then you can be the husband God has called you to be, the father, the worker, and the warrior. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Whose power? His power. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Whose armor? It's God's armor. It's God's power. It's God's armor. It's his name that's above every name. It's his victory that is our victory. Be spirit empowered and fight the good fight of faith. You're on the winning side. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, No one serving as a soldier, a warrior, gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Here Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you're going to have to take on the mentality of a warrior, and you have to see yourself as a warrior and God as the commanding officer. And as the warrior... You move in submission, obedience to the orders of the commanding officer. And Timothy, that is how you will impact this city. There's a great work of God happening in Ephesus, and Timothy is going to lead the spiritual influence of the city. And Paul says, if you're going to do that, you have to have the mentality and get men around you that have the mentality of the spiritual battle. If your theology makes no place for Satan, you will fight people. We have a real enemy and it's not flesh and blood, it is Satan. Let's take up the weapons that are spiritual, not carnal, but mighty for the pulling down of these strongholds that we are fighting. Come on, take a minute. Thank you, Jesus. Timothy, you're like the warrior. God's the commanding officer. See, the way you see God will determine how you serve God. We know he's a shepherd and we are the sheep. He's leader, we're follower. We know he's the father, we're the son. So we have a spirit of adoption. We know whose we are. And when you know who you are, you can then live up to what you're called to do. It's never doing over being. It's being before doing. You are the son of God. He's the vine, we're the branch. We have to have power to flourish. The power comes from the vine. So as we stay in obedience, in relationship, connectivity has everything to do with productivity. So we serve him out of how we see him. And Paul is making sure that Timothy not only sees him as shepherd, father, vine, but commanding officer. Because there is a fight that we are called into. It's a spiritual battle. And we're going to stand and win this fight. Mm. In the Spartan history, the Persian king started taking Greek city-states. Much like Rome, the Persian king would say to each city leader, you pay the money we want, you live according to, to our value system, you get to stay. You're not willing to do that, we kill you, we take your city. 
Every one of these Greek city-states had walls. When they got to the Spartans, the Persian king noticed they had no wall. Said to the commander of the Spartans, here's the offer, just like we've given everybody else. But you better look at them. Everyone who didn't do it the way we wanted, they're now gone and we have their city. We have taken their territory. We will do the same to you. And it will even be easier because you have no wall. And that, com that Spartan commander let out a war cry and out of every direction came all of these Spartan warriors. They locked their shields and in unison lifted their voices and said, we are the wall. Now put it in a spiritual context. Come on, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, breastplate of righteousness, and the shield of faith. We are the wall. The way you see him will determine the way you serve him. You're a spiritual warrior. Mm. John Eldridge said, if you... If you, you live in a world at war, spiritual attack must be a category you think in or you will misunderstand more than half of what happens in your life. Why all the challenges? Where, where does all this stuff come from? How is the temptation, the challenge so, so personal and so specific? Because we are in a war and the enemy is watching over our lives, trying to plot and plan in such a way that he can break us down, take us down, and keep us down. C.S. Lewis, in his screw tape letters, he writes about how this young demon would be mentored to destroy Christians. The young demon would be mentored by an older demon. C.S. Lewis, r reading this challenge of being a warrior who doesn't get caught up in civilian affairs, in his brilliance just extracted the Greek of civilian affairs and lets us see that it's about apathy. But it's not apathy because a man is lazy. It's because a man is very busy, but so busy and succeeding that if not careful, can misprioritize a God first, a passion for Jesus. And so even though there's great success, there is a low spiritual temperature. And when there's a low spiritual temperature, we can get into the trivial, that civilian, not things, not all things that are sinful, but just things that are less important. And so C.S. Lewis says this older demon is going to mentor the younger demon who's going to set out to destroy Christians. And this younger demon describes these big things that he is going to challenge every Christian with. And the older demon says, if you come with those big things you will trigger the defenses of the Christians. So pick smaller, more subtle things and use those to lull them into an apathetic spiritual sleep. When I was a freshman at Evangel University, I made the decision to go there just four weeks before the first day. So I took whatever room they had the only space was on the hall where all the football players were. And I felt like a grasshopper among giants. These people were huge. A roommate, huge football player, sweet mate was the quarterback. And my mom would send me on regular occasions what we called a care package, chocolate chip cookies, Rice Krispie treats, just all that good stuff. And when I would come down the hall, the word would get out that Woods got a care package. And I'm telling you, in minutes, 
That stuff was gone. So I had to become more strategic. Even when I would get a package and hide it in my room, they would turn my room upside down, find it, and consume it. So I got an idea. And I hid the care package in their room because they didn't think of looking for it in their room. And so I found a way to succeed in keeping these big giant men from getting into my care package. But no matter where I put it, I couldn't keep it from the ants. It's like our dorm was built on an ant hill. So it wasn't the big things, it was the little things. C.S. Lewis says, it matters not how small the sins, as long as it edges them out of the light. He said, choose the gradual road. Man, I, I, I come with a word of thanks for the way you fight, the way you are alert to the small things. The small things that start eating away at your passion for Jesus, that start taking just kind of like thread by thread the, the values that you live by that come from the word of God. I want to thank you for guarding that which God has committed to you, guarding like a warrior. Thank you that you see God helping to guard your heart and you guard your heart and the Holy Spirit guards your heart. Thank you for being sensitive to not just the overt attacks, but the subtleties of Satan, just that constant, just that drip, drip, that over time, it's like the cooked frog, put him in, in, in water and gradually heat it up. And it, you know all the stories, but just thank you for being alert because we're in a fight. And that fight is for truth in a world of lies. It is for community in a world of isolation. We all know that Satan tempts us and if we fall to the temptation, it looks so good and Satan showed us all the good side of evil. And, and we just almost electrified to go for it and we cross that line and the minute we cross the line and, and we sin, then he's there piling the shame on us. How could you do that? How could you not see that? Why? You knew better. You were, but you, you cashed it in and he piles the shame on us. And when we deal with shame, it's the very thing that pushes us from community to isolation. And then we become an even easier target for the enemy. Thank you for fighting for community in a world of isolation. Thank you for fighting for unity in a world of division. See, the mercenary is the warrior who has incredible skill, but offers that skill to the highest bidder and can be very hurtful in the ability to fight the fight. You're in submission to Jesus. And so you're in the spiritual battle. And I'll show you in a minute where Jesus was aggressive with demons, but loving toward people. Thank you for fighting for commitment in a world of compromise. Where you hold to covenant and you hold to commitment and you hold to conviction. Thank you for fighting for love in a world of lust so that you can model how a relationship was designed to flourish. In this fight, I challenge us to submit to God and resist the devil. Submit your heart, submit your home, submit your future, submit it all to Jesus, and then resist the devil. God put Adam in the garden and one of the roles was to build something and to keep watch. And when the snake slithered in, Adam should have dealt with that snake. Shouldn't talk to the snake, tolerate the snake, hope the snake doesn't strike, kill 
the snake. Jesus was aggressive with evil spirits and demons, but gentle with people. He goes to the very cemetery where there's a young man who is possessed with demons. Imagine all the Father's Day where his dad was just wanting his son to be back in his right mind. And finally, when Jesus shows up, there is no negotiation. There is no tolerating these evil spirits. Immediately, aggressively, they are cast out. And the young man gets freedom because Jesus deals violently with the devil and gently with us. I am not saying that conviction will not burn in your heart. I'm not telling you that the weight of God's love will not be heavy at times trying to get you to turn back to him. But Jesus loves you and he's aggressive with the devil who's trying to destroy you. And thank you, men, for fighting in such a way that's directed with aggression at the devil and love toward people. As the worship team comes today, Nehemiah, he taught the people how to build and battle at the same time. And they did more in 52 days than what Israel had done in 52 years. And I just celebrate all the men and the dads in this room that are fighting the good fight of faith. There will be a day that we'll put these weapons down, these spiritual weapons of the power of prayer, the word of God, the name of Jesus, pleading the blood in faith. All of these weapons, one day, we won't need them anymore. But until that day, we fight the good fight. We are, we are the wall. Come on, if you believe it, put some passionate praise right there. We are. Come on, we are the wall. We're going to guard our families. We're going to guard the future. Come on, church. We're going to guard the destiny. We're going to guard our testimony. We're going to guard the great commission. We are. I said we are the wall. We are the wall to stand in the place of prayer, to stand in the gap. We are the wall. To be that one who declares the word of God in faith. We are the wall. What I want to do in closing is I want to invite here in a moment every dad and every man. And I want you to come forward when I give you that request. And we're going to fill in across the front. And it's going to look like a wall. A wall of men of God saying, I'm going to fight the good fight. Come on. Let's be passionate, let's be intentional, let's be faithful in the fight.